friends. I'd like to begin with a story from the indigenous people of Australia. It goes like this. Once upon a time there was uh, an Aboriginal tribe that settled along a mighty river. It was teeming with all kinds of freshwater creatures that sustained the people and provided much security and well-being for them. They lived happily along its banks. And one day, a big flood came and submerged everything in its path. The people had to leave their homes and evacuate to dry land. When the flood subsided, they went back and resettled where they used to. But then things were not quite the same after the flood. The river floor became weaker and weaker by the day. What was once a mighty river gradually was reduced to what we call in Australia a billabong. The people sat daily around its edge and wondered when the river floor would return. It was all very sad and depressing until some of them decided to go upstream and find out what had happened to their mighty river. They returned later to announce, incredibly, that the river had not dried up at all. It had merely changed its course. Religious life is at a critical juncture. It finds itself inundated by the destructive floods of secularization. I don't have to remind you that in most Western societies, we are confronted with uh, unprecedented problems. Judging by many, many measures, some would even say that our best days are behind us. They are ready to write obituaries for a life so glorious in the past, but now hopelessly riddled with crisis. Let's make no qualms about it. We feel it too, in our bones. Every day we struggle to come to terms with an acute sense of loss. Our numbers, our resources, our status, our prestige, and even our own identity and morale. There is a sense that we have arrived at a place until now unknown, uncharted, and unexplored. Perhaps it can be compared to the experience of these Aborigines who sat around the edges of the billabong, wondering what had happened and why things were not the same anymore after the big flood. Like them, we can seek to recapture and restore the past, or we can also embark on the road ahead with trust and courage like those who follow where the river flow. Franciscans have been known to be good travelers who have explored new frontiers. It's in our DNA to read the signs of the times and to follow where the river flows. In a Louis Reservoir was the first priest a French conventual who landed in Australia in 1788. Maxim Maximilian went to Japan in 1930, and countless other friars went to unknown places. We are not meant to be settlers. This was the reason Francis refused the stability of the monastic model. We are at our best in times of transition and crisis. This is because our charism is not about maintaining a structure. Parishes, schools, hospitals, sanctuaries, and the like. I dare say that it's not even about being a workforce for the church. Rather, our charism is to make the spirit of the gospel alive in service for the church.
and for the world. And we do so not from a position of power, strength of our number and resources. We do it best by being people of complete surrender, complete vulnerability, and yet complete freedom. We leave our vocation in transition, neither here nor there, in betwixt and between, in liminal, peripheral, prophetic, precarious places like a primitive Rimokoto that challenges the status quo and invites all to a better future. Francis uses simpler words. He speaks of us friars being pilgrims and strangers in this world. The Gospel today sums up the essence of a Franciscan spirituality. It was the very text that inspired Francis to embrace the way of life as revealed to him by the Most High. Thomas Gelano wrote that after hearing this very passage, Francis exclaimed, This is what I wish, this is what I seek, what I long for with all my heart. Francis, of course, did not mean that the life of preaching and mission would therefore be referred to that of uh, prayer and contemplation. This would be a false dichotomy and distortion of his dream and passion. Instead, what Francis found in the text was the call to announce the gospel, not with words first and foremost, but with the manner of one's life. Hence the instruction to carry nothing for the journey and to submit humbly to others is part of Franciscan sequela Christi. My brother St. Francis, during these days of the general chapter, we seek to discern God's call and renew our efforts in following and applying that call. At this critical juncture, the flux, or when the flood of secularization inundates the church and the order with many problems, we feel this is empowered and perhaps even disillusioned. The Word of God and the example of Francis remind us, however, that our strength does not consist necessarily in hidden ways and means. Rather, it lies in the renunciation of power, the acceptance of our vulnerability, and the commitment to live in communion. Therefore, when, when we are stripped of human power through the loss of our resources, and our number, it might be the time for us to shine that beacon of hope which is born of vulnerability. Remember when St. Francis was stripped naked by his father, it turned out to be a decisive moment, a moment of grace. The first reading today speaks about communion with God through the image of the holy mountain. While the Gospel alludes to Christ sending the disciples, not solo, but in pairs. These two dimensions are indispensable to the Franciscan way of life. In recent times, there has been a growing consciousness in our order that safeguarding and promoting the communion of prayer and fraternity is the only way of having for us. I noticed the Minister General very bravely proposed to increase the number of friars in a canonical priory from three to four to five. That might not have been a good pitch for re-election. Nevertheless, it points to the heart of who we are as friars of the community. In a time of diminishment and uncertainty, it takes courage seek and to apply new ways of being more authentic and prophetic. We are told that the disciples set off to preach the good news with joy and enthusiasm, knowing that God's power would manifest through their witness. 
as we are about to set off ourselves after our own Pentecost experience here in Assisi, may the Holy Spirit accompany us in our living and sharing of the good news. May the charism that has found rich expressions in 800 years of Franciscan history continue to guide and inspire us. Today we honor St. Colette, who lived the Franciscan charism in new and radical ways. Let she be an example of faithful and creative living as we seek to honor her legacy and that of those before us. Let us not fear the unknown and unexplored places that we have been led to, for greater things await us in our pilgrimage of faith. And so I conclude with the parting words of the late Pope John Paul II. Do not be afraid. Let us launch ourselves into deeper waters.